Hi everyone, I am here at the Bible study. I hope you guys are having a good night. Let's see here. All right. So Matthew or today we are in Matthew chapter 16. And the devotion tonight is by Teresa Goyer. I think she's new. I don't, I don't remember hearing from her to you. But the Bible verse that goes along with her devotion is Matthew 16:24 and it says, "Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. All right, so let's put that down. I also have an animal devotion for you as well. I keep turning the book to the book of Job because that's where I got my bookmarker at. It was on a card that I made this bookmarker out of a card that dad gave me. It said daughter on it. And I use it as a bookmark. I took it off the card and made it into a bookmark. It says, for my daughter, watching you write the story of your life has been amazing. I've been so proud of you as you followed your heart and decided who you are and who you want to be. Isn't that beautiful? I couldn't just throw that out. I cut it up and made a bookmark. And it's in the book of Job. <laughs> All right, so now let me read from the Bible to you guys from Matthew chapter 16. We'll be talking about the demand for a sign, wicked generation, which our generation would do the same thing, wouldn't they? Today, if Jesus came here before he took everybody back, if he just came here for a visit, let's just say, people would not believe. They would ask for a sign. They would ask for him to do many miracles. Then they'd see him do one and then ask for more things. That's just how it is. It's awful. The yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're the worst, the teachers of the law. Peter's confession of Christ, Jesus predicts his death. Okay, you know how the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, always treated Jesus. They were never good to him. They always wanted him dead and gone. All right. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He knows he raised, they know he raised people from the dead. He's healed them of sickness. He's healed them from demons. Look what all he done. Turned the water into wine, his very first miracle. How many miracles does he have to do to prove to them that he's the son of God? Sad. So sad. Can you imagine being alive back then and Jesus being treated this way? The Son of God. He replied, When evening comes, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know, for the sky is red. Or sorry, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Now, just think about that for a minute till I stop. Nothing will be given except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. And they had to be thinking, what is he talking about? Jonah was in the belly of the well. Yeah, three days. Get it? You guys know what that means. The sign of Jonah. Because Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days and then released. Jesus will be hung on the cross. Will be dead for three days and then rise on the third day. Back to life. Just like Jonah was after his third day. Jesus raised as well. And Jonah was spit out of the well. But the sign of Jonah... That's what he means. That's what he's talking about. But nobody, including his disciples most of the time, don't understand what Jesus is trying to tell them. And Jesus explains it, you know, better to them. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Like, here's, a, here's an example. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's talking about be careful for the things they say and do are bad and 
They'll try to trick you. You know, they're bad. They're bad. They have bad people have bad ways. They discussed them among themselves and said, it is because we didn't bring any bread. Yeast, bread, you know. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, You of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? <laughs> Do you still not understand? They seen him, they seen him feed the 5,000 and more, and <laughs> they think you can't make bread. Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, This is so stupid. They replied, Some say John the Baptist. John the Baptist was alive when Jesus was alive. This is the stupidest thing. Why did they think he's John the Baptist? Yes, John Baptist was beheaded, but him and Jesus were together on the earth. And everybody saw John. They knew who John was, John the Baptist. So if Jesus was already around, how could he be John the Baptist? That is the stupidest thing they, that those people ever said, the, you know, the teachers of the law. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah. But Jesus said, Elijah had come through John the Baptist. Jesus was Jesus, the Son of God, no one else. And others still say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So sad. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. St. Peter. And he did. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. The teachers of the law and them are not going to believe that anyway. That's why when Jesus says he's the son of God and says anything about God being you know, anything of close to him. They like want to stone him. They think they're the ones highest to God. That's God, then it's them. They're the most important. They don't want Jesus around and people following him. That's taken away from the people listening to them. I know that's why. You can tell what kind of people they are. They want the people to listen to them and them only, what they're teaching, not what Jesus is teaching. He was not causing an uprising or a riot. They're the ones that did. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. 
What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? He'll have nothing. He'll be in hell for eternity, not able to get out. Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory and his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And that was all of Matthew chapter 16. Now, as you know, they always did that to Jesus. Always. And it's, it's just so sad. But Jesus tells them, and he has to come out and plainly tell them what this means, what is going to happen to him, and the things that they do to Jesus. If they were going to crucify him, why didn't they just take him and crucify him? They didn't have to treat him the way they did. Spit on him, mocked him, hit him, flogged him, put that thick crown of thorns on his head and blood pouring down his face. he done nothing wrong to anybody. And that's how they treated him. I would not want to be those people and face Jesus when I died. Wouldn't that be a shock to them? And we had you killed. Would Jesus be standing there in front of them. Now, I've watched recently some near-death experiences where people have went to hell. And their stories of what hell was like when they were there were very, very similar. And Sherm said he had a dream about it as well. They said they were, they had a, bun a bunch of like little cages, rooms everywhere. And Satan looked just like a man. This is a regular man. You know, nice looking man, but he, black eyes, you, you know, he's evil. And the demons would torment them every day. And Satan would come like one time a day and Anyway, they were put in these like little cages, these little rooms, and their worst fear, like if you're afraid of snakes, Satan knows that. And in the cage you're in, it's full of snakes tormenting you every day, every night, constantly. Whatever you're afraid of is in that cell with you. Not only one person told that, and the, their stories were like exact. People that do not know each other at all. And Sherm dreamed about it too. I mean, the same things. That sounds like hell, doesn't it? It does to me. I sure wouldn't want to be in one of them things. No. Not with my worst fear. Nuh-uh, no. This one guy's fear, his fear was falling. He was always afraid he was going to fall. So in his cell... It would shoot him up in the air and drop him down. Constantly. Constantly. He'd be falling. And the demons will torment you every day. And Satan will come and torment you even more. <sighs> or would you rather live in paradise? Where there's no sickness, no pain, no sadness. For eternity. With God and Jesus and the ones whom you love that are going to be in heaven or are in heaven. Which sounds better? Because once you die, not everybody gets a near-death experience. Those are rare. Once you die, it's, it's done. It's over. There's no asking for forgiveness or asking Jesus to save you then. You belong to Satan if you don't have Jesus. I feel bad for the people that are there and the people that are going there. Why didn't they just, why didn't they believe in God? Why don't they want to know God? It, some people had to see to believe and it's sad.
All right, guys. So let me read the devotion now. I would not but want to be the one that did not tell that person about Jesus, about God. And then they'll go to hell and then they'll be like, why didn't you just tell me? Why didn't you tell me about Jesus and try to help me? I wouldn't want to be that person. So Tricia says, Years ago, I started praying, Lord, give me your heart. Because of that, I was able to stop worrying about whether I would ever be any good. When did being good enough become the right pursuit for Christ followers? Attending church, reading the Bible, praying with your kids, not yelling, volunteering at church, loving our neighbors. When I focus on being good, it's easy to get discouraged. I'm human. I am never going to live up to the perfect standard in my mind. There are many examples from God's word, things Jesus urges us to do. Go ye into all the world. Respect your husbands. Pray for your enemies and care for the widows and the orphans. Being obedient to Christ is acting out his heart on this earth. Obedience is not easy. It takes patience to drive my grandma around town on errands when I'd rather be working on my own projects. It's difficult trying to calm a newly adopted child who's lashing out. Following Christ in these ways invites suffering into my desire for comfort life. But isn't that what we're supposed to do? First Peter 2.21 says, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. I wonder what would happen if more Christians obeyed these directives. Would the watching world be drawn to Christ in us in many ways? Would we stop worrying about being good and instead start worrying about being available? And she does have homework for you tonight if you want to do it. Write down three areas in which you struggled with being good. Below those areas, write, Jesus, give me your heart. Then think of three ways you can be obedient to Christ's heart like praying for an enemy or helping a widow. That was a really good one. Good job, Teresa. I really liked that one, didn't you guys? And so true. Get the animal devotion out here. All right, this one is by Linda Bartlett. And it is called Learning from Lizards. And it goes with Psalm 130 verse 5. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in this world I put my hope. I put my hope in God. I spent a year as a zookeeper of sorts. That would be so fun. I would love to work at the zoo or at a vet's clinic. My friends would tease me saying that was when I had three young boys at home but the boys were most like mayhem makers than zoo animals. No, I actually took care of animals at a residential school for children waiting for foster homes. Since this was a temporary home for the children, they were allowed to have pets. The pets, however, had to be housed in a separate facility, hence the need for caretakers. Bunnies and birds were great, but when I took the job, I didn't realize I would also be working with lizards. What kind of pet was that? A popular one with boys, as it turns out. Well, of course. Uh, my nephew's got a bearded dragon. Loves that thing. Taking care of the lizards included feeding them live crickets. That skill was not on my bucket list. I wasn't pretty, but I soon learned it was doable. The lizards learned too. They soon realized it was their lunch date, 
When they saw me enter the area, they would climb up on their individual perches and wait. I was pretty sure they were smiling. Until that point in my life, I had not realized how intelligent and trusting lizards are. They had the faith and hope that I would provide meals for them. They would graciously wait until I prepared their food and then humbly accept it. God asked me to wait patiently, with trust like those lizards did. They had it down pat. I, however, often get impatient with God's timing. I was blessed with human intelligence, but I learned quite a bit about waiting, hoping, and trusting from lizards. That's a good one. Amen. Father, may I, like a lizard, wait, trust, and hope. Amen. Linda Bartlett. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you guys have a great rest of your night. Let's bring those souls to Jesus and God willing. We'll see you guys again soon with another Bible study. Good night, guys.